Hello! So, in this talk on the Writer's Guide, we're going to be talking about warfare. Something very, very, very close to my heart. Um, I studied it in university. And... Um, I studied ancient warfare in university. And ancient civilizations. And whenever I see it done wrong in fiction, it's something that I always lament. It's something that I always think, oh my god, what are they doing? Oh my god, you know, do they not realise how stupid this makes them look? Um, I'm somebody, I'm not a snob when it comes to many things. But in, in warfare and fiction, especially in fantasy fiction, I am definitely a snob. I am definitely someone who, who expects you to get it right. Expects you to, to, do, your, to do your research, because um, warfare when you're not in it is fun. Um, <laughs> to research. Uh, there is a... Uh, um, there's a, there's a man, man called uh, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, who said that uh, war is glorious to those who've never had any experience of it. You know, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it, that's what it is. It drives the uh, the excitement of a lot of your plots in fantasy fiction, because most of us are using in fantasy fiction are using armies and are using people to walk around a battlefield and fight. Um, one thing I will make as a proviso, if you're writing a medieval fantasy fiction, this is the video for you. If you're writing anything with a sci-fi, with a, you know, over-the-top magical place where you can just magic things into thin air like troops and stuff, this isn't for you. Um, this this video is about making sure that you have the tools to put a army or war into your setting that is medieval, that is true to life, and that actually makes sense. So, with that out of the way, warfare. How should it work in fantasy fiction? So, three things first that I want to go over. Uh, number one, war should never be cool. And what I mean by that is, um, I, I see far too many times in video games and things like that, you know, somebody standing on a big platform with a sword out going, yeah, and then all the troops going, yeah, you know, it, it those things happen, but not all the time. Um, war should be. Uh, if you want a really good way of doing warfare, look at The Witcher 3, if you've ever played that game. If you haven't, or video games aren't your thing, um, please go on YouTube and look at Witcher... F uh, enter in Witcher 3 Velen. V-E-L-E-N. And that will show you what warfare should look like. It's desolation. It's muddy. It's rough. It's tragic. It's a decline... Of everything apart from the people at the very top, you know, people being downtrodden all the time. That's what warfare is. Um, in learning about warfare in university, um, I I got two things were more profound to me. Uh, three things actually. Number one was the sheer amount of respect that I developed for people who actually went through these things. Um, I mean, nowadays I have a lot of respect for soldiers, of course, but it's a lot different uh, taking drilling a guy between the eyes at a at two hundred yards than it is to actually facing a charging horde of 300 uh, about you know 3000 horsemen coming directly for you with spears leveled at you it, those are two completely different things and for someone to stand there and actually take that to the brunt of the face you know and actually not run away is is shows balls of steel as far as I'm concerned um the second thing was um well actually it's only two things the, the second thing was the snobbery at which you know historians treat warfare, which is because they see it as the Hollywood, they see it as something that no one really wants to, no real academic should have any any interest in, which is complete bollocks, um, because uh, warfare is the means by which civilizations have always spoken to each other, uh, trade and warfare, those are the two things that we do well as humans, and if you're British, you're good at queuing as well, but apart from those two, three, the three things, that's what we do well, so. Um, war should never be cool, and that, that was the other thing that, that, that I really want to hammer home. Um, war itself should never be aggrandized. Okay? That being said, set pieces should be cool and affect your plot. Okay? So set pieces should really, like battles and like uh, sieges and things like that, they really should affect the plot as you go forward. Um, and they really should be cool. They should look cool, they should feel cool. They should feel uh, exhilarating, because it's very hard to put the reader in the in the battle without making things seem cool. 
um, if you you're in a movie or you're in in, a, in any sort of visual medium, it's a lot easier to make things seem bloody and horrible, and you know, goddamn terrifying, um, and still keep people in the moment because they're seeing it. Okay, you're asking somebody to, to suspend their disbelief and see things in their mind's eye when you're writing a piece of fiction. So it's very, very important to make sure that the, your set pieces are cool. The effects of war are not cool. The effects of war should be terrible. But the actual set pieces themselves should be cool. And don't shy away from them like George Martin does. Don't don't pussy out and not give me a battle that I've earned. Go for it. Uh, number three, uh, war should be fought for the right reasons. And that is what we are going to go on a bit later on. Uh, but that is one of the main things about your fantasy fiction. War should be fought for all of the right reasons. Okay, casus belli. Casus belli means a reason for war, essentially, in Latin. Why do we go to war? Well, your kingdoms and empires and your settings should be at war for the right reasons, as we just said. Those right reasons could be territory, okay? Common. It was a common way for people to go to war. Uh, but almost always the, the, always the territory is a, second, a secondary to another goal. Um, for instance, when um, the young king, Henry II, is, is fighting his father, Henry III, um, he's invading Normandy all the time and trying to invade England. But he's not really trying to secure England. He's trying to make his father come to the table and treat with him and give him more power. That's the reason behind the war. He may be invading territory, but the territory is just a means to an end. It's not really there to make sure that he has exactly, you know, that he has this land. That's not what it does. And um, the territory, just a means to an end. It's just so he can, if, if he captures his king, if he um, brings his king to the table, to the negotiating table, that's what he wants to do. Um, so, so don't generally don't put walls in your in your fiction that is just I'm going to go and conquer this territory because there's always another reason behind it, and those are the more interesting ones than I want to go and conquer this territory. So. Uh, number three, wealth. Yeah, also common, but a nation's people are unlikely to want to die for it. You know, if you're a peasant and you, you know the levies are called up, you're on, and 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 the reason for going to war is so your lord can go and pillage a village next door and not share any of the wealth with you. You're very unlikely to want your son to go and fight in said war, and it's very very more likely to affect people adversely and make sure that there's a rebellion in the country that wants to declare said war. So. Wealth, if if it is a motivation, it should be in the it should definitely be in the background. Look at America and Iraq and things like that, yeah, with oil prices and things. The wealth was what well, probably probably the driving force behind that war, but it was kept in the background, yeah. It was kept behind an ideology, which brings us on to the fourth, ideological, not common and controversial. So it's not common in fiction because it's controversial, uh, because that means you're literally going to war with another people because they are of a different different race or culture that is abhorrent to your own. Now you can imagine how how charged that would be in the in the modern in the modern world that we live in these days, where people are offended by almost anything. Um, I would love to see someone do this right. If somebody actually put an ideological war into their fiction, I, I'm I'm yet to figure out a way to do it. Um, I'm working on it. Eventually, I will do. But ideological wars can be very narrow-minded, and, and to be honest with you, they they're they're affected by the same limitations that a wealth-based war is. Um, yeah, you know, people are, are unlikely to want to go to war over an ideology because some of them might not actually, you know, see it your way. That's the wonderful thing about human beings. There's a really good quote in Mass Effect about human beings, where if you put two human beings in a in a, any room, you'll have four different opinions on a diff on one subject. You know, so they're really really hard to do. With a race like the Canari in Dragon Age, you could probably do it. Um, you know, when they're all think meant to think the same way. Um. But normally, they're very, very, very difficult. Very difficult to do. And number five is religious. The Crusades. Think the Crusades. If you are writing... I'm going to come out and say it now. If you are writing medieval fantasy fiction, the Crusades, or something like the Crusades, a religious war should be in your work of fiction. I'm just going to come out right now and say it. Uh, medieval society is a very religious society. It's a very... Um, monotheistic society normally and when you look at the differences between uh, Christians and Muslims they are minute in terms of you know, actual beliefs they are very very minute differences but those differences you know brought us the Crusades and even into the modern day where those two religions generally genuinely don't like each other don't like each other so 
but a religious war is a very good way of getting around an ideological war problem as well, uh, because it's basically ideological warfare light. Okay, so it's not quite the Nazis exterminating people, but it's still we are there, we are us, they are them. Fuck them. Let's go kill them. That's generally what the religious wars are, and they are very charged in terms of um, in terms of the modern world. If you want to draw parallels there, that would also be really really good. And also, basing uh, wars in your fiction on wars that actually happen in real life. I wouldn't give a blow-by-blow -blow account of, of the wars that happen in real life, but definitely be inspired by them, because um, they're, they're there for a reason. They're an object lessons, okay? Alright, unrealistic wars. Generally, things not to do. Wars to save princesses. Um, and I will also put on this um, normal people, yeah? Wars to save princesses or poor or, or people. Even if even if a king is 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 run is is held captive, wars will, will generally not be waged to get them back. Um, you know, Eddard Stark in Game of Thrones, for example. Uh, there's no way in an actual medieval society, an entire kingdom would go to war with another one just to get one person back. It would not happen. They are too expensive. Um, you know, they they would definitely they would rather pay the price in silver than they would in actual manpower. Yeah, you know, because it would cost far. It would cost far more for the North in, in Game of Thrones to come south and try and again and get Eddard back through warfare than it would to actually just just pay up a ransom. Yeah. So wars to say princesses they were not worth all that much in medieval society. Princesses, I mean, um, the father of William Marshall, who is a very 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 famous knight. And actively sacrificed him to King Stephen because he did not want to give up a small castle. At this time, William Marshall's father, John Marshall, was in open rebellion almost with King Stephen. Um, basically, he'd made a, a castle called Newbury Castle and against the wishes of King Stephen, and that was it. And so King Stephen laid siege to it. It was a very small castle. Uh, John Marshall gave over William Marshall to King Stephen uh, to basically say, hey, I'm going to go into my castle and basically make sure that all these people... Um, you know, that, that all these people lay down for you when they open the gates. And King Stephen said, okay, you give me your son, then I will take that as read that you're going to do what you're told, because if you don't, I'll kill him. And of course, John Marshall refused to open the gates. He put on really staunch defence, and for months, it looked like King Stephen was going to execute William. He didn't in the end, but that shows you how little worth people had, single people had, in this, in this type of setting. Women had little worth, unfortunately. Yeah, there may be childbearers, but once they're past a certain stage, they have no worth in a medieval society. It's horrible, and it's wrong. And people call and people like Eleanor of Aquitaine will show you that you know you can go out and you can actually make something of, of yourself if you're a woman. You know you can definitely hold claim to have certain powers and uh, to have real reigns over 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 an entire country. But you mostly do that from the background. You mostly do that you know from from through a, through a husband. Um, it wasn't as liberated as it is nowadays, of course. Uh, but my point is, if the father of William Marshall was was willing to ac actively sacrifice him to King Stephen, just because he didn't want to give up a small castle, that's a, that's his son. That's someone. Oh, that's my uh, my missus there. Uh, that's his son. That's someone who is actively. Um. um that's, just, that, that's somebody who is actively trying to... Ugh, sorry. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, that's, just some, that's somebody who could actively take over his lands. That's somebody who could, who could actively make sure that his name carries on. Uh, and he gives him up. So you can imagine what you would do if a woman was there. He wouldn't even... you know, He, he, he wouldn't be able to give his daughter to King Stephen because King Stephen would say, I'm not taking a woman. <laughs> because they're not worth very much. Um, so wars to save princesses? No. Wars to save people s singular in general? No. No, it wouldn't happen. Um, two. Large wars to press a lord's claims on small pieces of land? No. No. Right? If a small lordling wants to take over a piece of land, then he can do it himself in a small war. In a small war, he sends his troops in to try and take over. Large wars are not waged for small reasons. Never, ever, ever. Um, there may be a lot of small reasons combined together, maybe, but not one small reason. Um, three, wars to conquer land without pretext. This leads us back into religion. 
wars almost always need to be justified, especially within a religiously focused medieval setting. Many people fear the wrath of God or the gods and will not want to enter a conflict which may anger said gods, plural, maybe. So, again, in a setting that is medieval, you know, people would not be like, yes, let's go and invade France because screw France. It wouldn't happen that way. Um, it wouldn't happen like the way in Game of Thrones either. I know I'm using it as a bad example, but it is a bad example. It's, it's, it's yes, let's go and invade the south to get Eddard back and because we hate the southerners, screw them. Wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen. Okay? Um, it just it just wouldn't would not happen. It just would not happen. You need the blessing of God or the gods. You need need people to be on side. It, basically, you need a valid casus belly to go to war with somebody to try and take over land. You can't just march in there and take it over because that would go against the rules of chivalry and honor. If you have them in your society, they should be honored. They should be there. And even if you don't, you should have gods or a god. In your, in your medieval setting. I'm sorry, that's just how it is. If you want a medieval setting that's got a fantasy focus on there, you should use the real world as almost like a crutch and build your entire world around that. If you don't want to do that, that's fine, but just bear in mind you'll be writing for a very small group of people who want to have a world with fairies and all different blah things that are going on, okay? A lot of people want the bones of the world to be something they can touch. Something that they can use as a touchstone to then accept the more fantastical elements of your setting. So the sinews of war are infinite funds or infinite gold, as Cicero used to say. Wars are bloody expensive. They are expensive things. Keeping an army in the field is an incredibly costly process. You need to think about how your state pays for its troops. Does it have high taxation in wartime? Does it offer benefits for those joining the army? Does it have professional troops of its own? Or does it rely on mercenaries? You know? Numbers should be realistic. It makes no sense for a desert-based kingdom to suddenly call up an army of 100,000 men. <coughs> Game of Thrones. Okay? Uh, Dawn does not have 100,000 men. It should never have 100,000 men. There's no way Dawn should have 100,000 men. It's a desert kingdom. It should have 40 at most. And that's it if they have a good year. Um... Yeah, so, so so things need to make logistical sense. So logistics. Um, who's training these men? Where do they muster? And who leads them and why? All these things should be taken into account before you even start to plan your war and why it happens and when it happens. Okay? Um, in terms of uh, medieval warfare, the one, con one concession I'll probably give you is medieval warfare was basically a, a series of sieges. Um, so a guy I mentioned before, William Marshall, he only fought in one actual battle, and even that was the result of a siege. Um, battles were very, very rare because they were, the, the results of them were very up in the air, which is why they're very famous, like Agincourt, for instance. Um, medieval warfare was a series of grind-out, knock-down, drag-out, slobber-knocker-style sieges. They were not... 50,000 men on one far side, 50,000 men on the other, right, go! You know, and everyone runs at each other. Uh, that happened more in, in the in the ancient world because cities could be more easily taken in the ancient world. By the medieval period, cities are fortresses in their own right and are very, very, very hard to, to, to take. We've had th thousand years of, of uh, military um, engineering been happening since the since ancient times, so which is why you see a lot more open battles in medieval and in, in ancient times and classical history than you do in medieval history. Um, but I would I would allow you to have that. You know, don't be afraid to do battles in your in your war. Um, sieges are very boring things. They go on for a long time, and unless there are you know duels or um, stories going on inside the keep or intrigue, things like that. You know, it's not going to be that... You know, definitely have sieges in there, but it's not going to be that much of a, of a big deal if you don't, is what I'm saying. Um, again, logistic, there should be a reason for that. You know, are the cities in this place of the world easier to take so that it would be, make no sense to hide behind the walls? Yeah, go for it. You know, tell us why. Tell us why these things happen. Um, so, that's pretty much it. Make sure your countries can actually afford to go to war. And if they can't, then they probably shouldn't go to war, or you should make a point saying they probably shouldn't go to war, but they are anyway, and they'll probably lose. Or there's a big about-face term where they find lots of money, but there still needs to be 
a conscious thought given to the fact that some states just can't afford to go to war. They don't have the manpower, they don't have the wealth, they don't have the um, agricultural means to feed these people. It's an expensive process. A very expensive process. Probably the most expensive thing a country can do is go to war. Which is why a lot of people wanted to avoid it at all costs. So, let's wrap it all up, shall we? Warfare. Keep it grounded. Make sure you have a valid casus belly. Make sure you can afford the bloody thing. And make sure there are people who can actually fight it on the ground. Alright, that's pretty much it. So, why don't you show me, you know, how do you do warfare in your setting? How are you going to em employ it in your story? How are you going to employ it in your in your world? How is it going to... Um, can, can you see any things I put on here for a medieval fantasy fiction that you want to use for a world that isn't medieval fantasy fiction? Yeah? I'd be very interested to see that. Um, that's it. So, thank you very much, and I'll speak to you guys next time.